Hey everybody, welcome to our DAT IQ weekly market update. This is our update for July 17. It's episode 254. I'm Dean Croak, market analyst here at DAT, sitting in for Ken Adamo, and I'm joined today by our special guest, Adam Wingfield. Adam, uh, welcome to the show. Tell a little bit of, uh, about yourself and what you do at Innovative Logistics. Thanks for having me, Dean. My name is Adam. I'm the founder and CEO of Innovative Logistics Group. We're a carrier consulting firm based out of Charlotte, North Carolina, and our primary focus is to support small carriers in the marketplace. As you know, nine out of the 10 of every trucking company that's out there has less than 10 trucks. So we represent that 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 bulk of majority of folks that are in the market that do need those supporting things such as compliance and other resources in order to maintain success within trucking. Yeah, yeah that's fantastic. Um, as we were talking about before the show, there's not too many uh, people in the industry that have been on the operational side, on the driving side. Um, you mentioned you had about 11 years as an owner operator. That's correct. That's correct. A million miles and safe, you know, knock on wood, million miles safe, safe driving. And, and, and I'm very, very mm -hmm. proud of that, that it gave me the opportunity to really see the, uh, the opportunity mm -hmm. to really grow from the inside out. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, it's a hard transition to make. I, I made, made the transition after many, many years of over, over the road driving. And it takes a lot of time and effort to switch your thinking because, Adam, I don't know if this happened to you, but I found that the, the longer I stayed in trucking, the more I got disconnected from mainstream commerce because you, you really do get dis disconnected very quickly from how people communicate and what's going on in the broader economy. Even though you're hauling freight, you get disconnected from mainstream uh, economics really, really quickly. Did you find that? Of course, you know, it's, you yeah. become a part of that environment. You know, you're out there, you're, you're you're hustling up and down the road. And at the same time, you're trying to balance 11 hours of driving with 11 hours, 14 hours of trying to be a business owner and be on top of things. Uh, it becomes tough, man. It, it becomes very, very tough, especially uh, if you don't have the thick skin and, and the things that it would take to do that. And, you know, I think that's really, really important to understand is that there's a difference. Yeah. All right, well, this, is, this is going to be a good discussion, folks. Um, buckle up. Uh, we're going to bring Adam back in a little bit later. I'm going to uh, get into our market update. For those of you that are new to the show, we're here every Tuesday at 10 a.m. Eastern, 7 a.m. Pacific, talking about trends in the freight market. Most importantly, though, we're here to answer your questions, get those into the chat sections on your respective platforms as soon as possible. So let's dive into some of the key trends we're watching this week. Uh, Post-July 4, spot rates predictably back off a little bit. Uh, they retreated last week to within about one cent per mile of the three-month average for dry van flatbed and reefer. Imports were up slightly in June. Again, no uh, major news event there. They always go up in June. And they will go up again in July, according, uh, in August, sorry, according to forecast. That looks like being the peak this year. Again, that's on track with past years. Sometimes it's August, sometimes it's September. The coastal shift of imports that we've been talking about a lot uh, maybe reverting back to normal. Shippers have taken advantage of a lot less congestion on the West Coast. Uh, the recent uh, ratification of the ILWU agreement and, of course, lower intermodal and truckload rates off the West Coast have encouraged shippers to revert back to West Coast ports. Uh, Tim Denoyer's Cash Shipments Index, uh, Tim Denoyer from Act Research writes that report, uh, Shipments down 1.6% month over month. Uh, Tim wrote that uh, declining retail sales trends and ongoing destocking remain the primary headwinds for freight volumes, um, but the dynamics are shifting as real income improves and the worst of the destock is in the rear view mirror. Again, you can find that at uh, CAS. That's the CAS shipments report just out last week. Uh, of course, we're watching some of the big news this week as UPS prepares for a massive disruption in the event that the Teamsters Union strikes. Um, Last week, uh, it was reported that UPS have begun what they call business continuity training to prepare non-union employees to handle packages in the event that there is a strike. Uh, the union were firing off some salvos yesterday, warning the White House to stay out of negotiation. And lastly, the uh, June freight index from our uh, partners up in Canada, LoadLink, is out. You can find it at loadlink.ca. Uh, some of the highlights of the spot market activity in Canada. Canada to US loads are down 2% month over month, while the imbalance continues northbound. Loads from the USA to Canada are also down, but down by 5% month over month. So let's get started on our market update. Let's start with load to truck ratio and dry van. Spot market load posts bounce back um, during the first full shipping week of the year. Uh, no surprise there, volumes are still sit sitting around a half of what they were this time last year. Uh, last week's Operation Safe Driver Week, where the focus was on speeding, didn't keep many drivers away, not nearly as many as it did uh, during road check week in May. Uh, carrier equipment posts bounced back as carriers got back on the road. Uh, load to truck ratio moved up slightly to 2.66. 
in the refrigerated uh, load to truck ratio, spot market volumes are behaving much the same as they did throughout 2019. Last week's 20% decrease in load posts and 16% increase in carry equipment posts had them sitting almost exactly where they were in 2019. Load to truck ratio last week is at 3.83, almost identical to 2019, where when it was 3.85. And in flatbed, even though load posts bounced back following last week's 42% uh, increase, the flatbed spot market continues to soften as volume tracks to about 60% lower than this time last year. Uh, carrier equipment posts were up last week as carriers got back on the road in that sector. Last week's load to truck ratio on flatbed up to 807 Having a look at some of the markets around the country in our market condition index, we're starting off on the West Coast. Containerized import volumes were up by 17% last month in the port of Los Angeles. And as it always does, a considerable amount of that volume finds its way onto the spot market for warehouse market moves. One of the warehouse markets that we see a lot of volume moving is Los Angeles to Stockton. The volume of loads moved, that's loads moved as opposed to loads posted, loads moved were up 7% last month. Um, following a 23% increase the prior month, available capacity tightens slightly. Uh, spot rates on that lane up three cents a mile to $2.76. That's the higher since last September, still 64 cents a mile lower than this time last year. Remember, folks, these are line haul rates excluding fuel. You'd have to add about 42 to 43 cents per mile to factor in the fuel surcharge. Another warehouse market we watch closely on the uh, that's sort of directly connected to the Trans Pacific trade lane is Los Angeles to Phoenix. The volume of loads moved last week were up 25%. Spot rates up 18 cents a mile to $2.97. And at $1.95 per mile, state average spot rates in Indiana are identical to where they were in 2019. Last week, rates were up about a penny per mile. In the largest spot market in the state in Indianapolis, spot markets, the spot rates average $1.86 driven by some pretty good paying loads for carriers on regional halls to Detroit, where they were paying $2.21. Short haul loads to Chicago were paying $2.65. In the uh, refrigerated category, um, outbound line haul rates in the Pacific Northwest are starting to heat up. Um, normally, they start to get busy this time of the year. At the moment, all of the regional rates add up to about $1.72 for outbound lanes as a regional average. Uh, they've been steadily increasing over the last month. Produce season is starting. And rates typically peak around November each year, which is when the produce season reaches its peak. Um, according to the USDA, weekly truckloads of produce are identical to this time last year. Um, in Seattle, line haul rates have increased by about 14 cents a mile in the last month, only averaging $1.46 excluding fuel. Loads are paying carriers about 30 cents a mile more in nearby Pendleton at an average of $1.75. Have a look in the southwest in Houston. Um, line haul rates increased by four cents a mile last week to an average of $1.93. Regional loads north to Dallas paid carriers $724 a load. That's about $3 a mile or about $40 a load more than this time last month. So good paying loads from Houston to New Orleans at $3.10. That's about 36 cents a mile lower than this time last year though. A little bit of capacity tightness to report in Michigan last week at $2.41 per mile outbound loads paid carriers. Uh, 10 cents a mile more last week. The solid gains were reported in the Grand Rapids market. That's the largest spot market in the reefer section up there. Rates jumped 26 cents a mile to $2.57. And lastly, in flatbed, uh, carriers in the flatbed market um, in California were getting about an average of $2.26 a mile for outbound loads last week, up about 4 cents a mile across the state. Solid gains were reported in San Diego last, last month. There was a 4% increase in brake bulk tonnage into uh, San Diego. A lot of steel comes in there on brake bulk vessels. Uh, rates up 22 cents a mile to an average of $2.34 outbound uh, San Diego last week. Uh, in New Jersey, state average rates increased by 2 cents a mile last week up about nine cents a mile compared to 2019. Having a look on the East Coast in Miami, capacity tightened for the third week. Spot rates are up 20 cents a mile to an average of $2.14 outbound Miami. While in the larger spot market in Lakeland, Florida, rates dropped 16 cents a mile to $1.70. And wrapping up our market update with our year over year look at spot rates, uh, in dry van, after being flat for the prior week, dry van line haul rates lost uh, some of their energy last week. They dropped about three cents per mile. At $1.69, the national average dry van line haul rate is about 27 cents a mile lower. 
uh, but we're at about a penny per mile of the three month average spot rate. So essentially flat over the last three months. In the refrigerated category, reefer, the reefer spot market erased the past month's gains following last month's four cent per mile decrease. At $2.02, .02, line haul average rates for refrigerated loads are about 26 cents per mile lower than this time last year. But like dry van, are within a penny per mile of the three month average. And lastly, in flatbed, after mainly being flat in May and June, that trend has continued for the first two weeks of July. Flatbed line haul rates have been flat at around $2.09. The national average flatbed spot rate is about 37 cents a mile lower than this time last year and around 12 cents per mile higher than in 2017 and 2019. That's it for our market update this week. The long form version of today's report will be published at dat.com forward slash market update this evening. Uh, this week, we're talking about operating costs and some of the things that we're going to talk about with Adam when we bring him back in. Before we do that, though, let's get to our short term forecasts. So we start off with dry van. Um, so just a level set for those that haven't seen our forecast before. This is our short term forecast, 35 days out. Um, for those new to the show, the blue line in terms of the colour coding, the blue line is rolling, is a rolling seven day weighted moving average of historical rates. These are actual loads moved over 550 miles, excluding fuel. So they're line haul only. Our flagship model is rate cast, which is in green. Red is the short term model, uh, which heavily weights some of the more recent changes we're seeing in the market. And then you have yellow and gray, which are blends of the two in varying degrees and mixtures. So in dry van, uh, this week we're seeing model agreement uh, for the most part as that market continues to sort of dredge along the bottom, as we've been saying. The short term model in red and rate cast in green are still trying to balance recent trends with long term seasonality. The short term red line is anticipating the seasonal decline in spot rates post July 4. That happens every year. Rate casting green is suggesting spot rates to be flat for the next month, which is where I see the market heading in the short term. So I'm more inclined to think that the green line is closer to the mark this week. In refrigerated, uh, we're seeing a little bit more model disagreement. The short term model in red is reflecting the post July 4 slump in spot rates we normally see. It's anticipating uh, reefer rates to drop about eight cents per mile in the next 35 days. Uh, rate casting green is taking a more optimistic view of the market, which which is I don't think I quite agree with the rate cast optimism. Uh, I'm expecting reefer to be flat also out to about 35 days. So I'm sitting in between the red and the green line for refrigerated. And lastly, in flatbed, um, all of these models are in pretty much agreement. They all reflect a very soft market uh, overall. This is sort of the time of the year when volumes do fall off. We're past the peak in machinery movements, both import and domestic steel production has uh, peaked and moved on. That normally happens in March and April. Uh, Redcast is suggesting spot rates could slide another eight cents per mile in the next month after being flat for the next two weeks. I think the green ratecast is pretty close to where we will be. All right, so that brings us to our guest this week, Adam Wingfield. Let's bring Adam back in. Adam, we normally start off our show with a question of the week. Um, one of the questions that I've heard you pose and carriers ask is that um, um, you've had uh, carriers uh, turned down by brokers in the past because the brokers have said they don't have enough inspections. Sounds a bit counterintuitive, but what should a carrier do if he doesn't have enough inspections? So here's the thing, you know, the one thing that we see and one of, you, you talked about it in your breakdown just a few minutes ago where drivers are taking themselves off of the road during certain CVSA time periods, you know, like road check and things like that. You got to understand that because of the direction that the overall industry is headed, whether we like it or not, it's headed towards more of a we're trying to stop fraud. And that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to stop the double brokering and things that take place. And what that inspection does it gives them the assurities that there's an actual asset on the highway. Until they can come up with a better um, definitive resource, that's what they're using and that's what we have to adapt to. So instead of doing those things, like pulling yourself out of those, those areas when those particular things happen, we got to make sure that you are prepared by ensuring the pre-trip inspection is completed and things that you do on a day-to-day -day basis to make sure that your equipment is right. But you got to run your trucks in those lanes. You got to stop um, bypassing for, for lack of a better word, because when you do that, you're just limiting the brokers that you could potentially operate with. And if you don't typically operate within a, a marketplace where you're bouncing from broker to broker, and if you just have one specific broker that you work with, then, you know, that obviously that may not be applicable to you, but if you're into the marketplace, you're new, you're getting, you're cutting your teeth in there. And what you're doing is you're trying to bounce around and find brokers to work with. They're looking at your inspection histories. 
Now, one of the things that we see is that, you know, it might say, hey, well, Adam, I run lanes and the lanes that I run, the, the scales are always closed. And I understand that. What you're going to need to do at that point is you're going to need to, if you're looking for a long-term benefit, you're going to need to venture out and run lanes that you're, you're, you're typically not, not accustomed to and used to, to ensure that you provide yourself with that visibility. Hmm. You know, it's, uh, it sounds, I was just listening to you say that, and uh, it, it kind of feels really counterintuitive because I don't know about you, but I always would get anxiety when I'd approach a set of scales, not that because, you know, there was something wrong or I knew something was wrong or I was you know, running illegal or hot. It's just the anxiety that normally comes with running onto a set of scales and, and in the post-ELD environment, it means losing time, you know, in particular if there's a long line of trucks. Um, I, I guess there'll be a lot of carriers who'll say, um, you know, that doesn't make sense, but I like what you're saying because creating some sort of a record gives people to uh, validate you as a carrier. That's essentially what you're saying. Exactly. And you know, the thing is, is you mentioned anxiety. It kind of reminds you if you go through a driver's license checkpoint, you know, it's the same yeah. type of feeling. You yeah. know, you know that everything is good, but you're like, man, I wonder if they just find something. And yeah. to have that validation now is so important because I'm telling you, brokers are getting more and more reliant upon validation software systems that validate that the carrier is actually in place and that the carrier is operating actual equipment types. And because they're doing that and because it's a, an aggressive push in that direction, then as a carrier, you know, you can't continue to fight the bull. You got to start getting on with the program and doing the things that we need to do in order to position yourself, especially in this type of marketplace. We remember back in, you know, the pandemic area when spot rates were, you know, were, were sky high and, and mm -hmm. brokers were throwing freight everywhere they could catch it. It's a different environment. You know, we're going back to more of the normalcy, which is the pre-COVID times. And now the brokers are being a lot more selective on who they do business with. And if they're going to be more selective on who they're doing business with, you got to position yourself in those areas to make sure that you're prepared for it. And you mentioned the fact the anxiety piece, well, it's really, really important now that you step up that game when it comes to doing that proper pre-trip inspection, making sure you take that extra time to do that walk around and make sure that all of the primary things that are the most things that they pick on when it comes to a scale house, lights, brakes, mm. tires, those mm. are the easy things to make sure that you're prepared. Mm. You know, Adam, um, I was looking at some of the weather reports this week. We've got some record high temps in the Southwest, um, bumping up on 111 in uh, Las Vegas. Uh, looking at some, you know, we've had 32 days of 100 plus in El Paso. Um, and, I, this is, uh, and I'm getting to a question here because I've often found that hot weather affects a lot of trailer pools, in particular, particular tyres that have a lot of recaps. Um, trailer pools in and of themselves tend to degrade faster because they're not being used as much and they're not being looked at and inspected as much. What sort of advice do you give to an owner operator that's, say, working in a trailer pool power only scenario? Man, you got to make sure you do that pre-trip inspection. And I, I know it sounds redundant, but you got to make sure that you ensure that that trailer that gets out there is prepared to hit the highway. And, you know, and that mm -hmm. comes from not just tapping the tires, because if you think about it, when it comes to this time of the year, you're blowing tires. Sure, the heat is related to it, but a lot of times it's because of the overall expansion of air in the tire and the weight on the trailer that's causing that to do so. So it's super important to make sure that we're not just thumping those tires. And I know it's going to take that extra step to get back there and put the tire tire gauge on there. Right. But you want to right. check that. Go to a Love's and get a tire pass done on that. But when you're right. pulling these trailers and there's trailer pools and whether it's intermodal pools, whether it's, you know, whether it's drop trailer pools, you have to make sure because you don't own that equipment. So you can't validate or verify any of the things that took place prior to you pulling that trailer. It is super important that you take an extra, you know, 15, 20, 30 minutes that it takes to make sure because at the end of the day, when you hook up to that trailer, it's yours, whether or not you own it or not, your, your responsibility is pulling down that highway on a safe manner. Yeah, it's great advice. Um, for a lot of carriers, it's often the most frustrating thing you get to, right? Someone else hasn't looked over a trailer and they've locked, dropped the trailer with a flat tire or something like that. Uh, but you're right, in a lot of states where they need probable cause to pull you over, the trailer is often the first thing that you can see. It's the easiest to see all the tires. They're not protected by wrap, you know, wrap around mud guards. It's easy to see worn tires and uh, damaged things. So that's really good advice. Appreciate you doing that. Adam, what's one of the, as you travel around the country and talk to some owner operators, um, and, and let's let's address this in two categories, Car carriers that have seen numerous market cycles, sort of the veterans of the industry, and carriers that are new that have come in that have only seen this current freight cycle where we had record high spot rates and now things have cooled off. What would you? What, is, what are sort of the things you're seeing those carriers do differently? 
man, the most di dynamic thing is the carriers that have seen the different cycles. They know how to prepare. It's almost like, you know, animals that prepare for the wintertime. They kind of store their eggs away. The carriers yeah. that I've seen, the owner operators and the fleet owners that I've seen that have been in different market cycles, they're really pretty cool when it comes to times like this. They operate with high efficiency. They're not taking in a bunch of overhead. They're managing their fuel costs. They have those same those same principles that guided them through every single market cycle. The ones things that I have a, a soft spot in my heart for is the ones that started in the pandemic that mm -hmm. um, really don't see the reality of what the industry is like. And, you know, listening to your market update, Dean, and, and, and hearing some of the rates that you were calling, you know, in my mind, it's normal. You know, in my mind, the things that you were talking about were really kind of normal of what we've seen mm -hmm. uh, in our in our timelines when it came to to being owner operators out there. Um, what they saw in the pandemic with that boost cause, it gave us a false sense of security, almost like the mirage in the desert. And now that they've got to the mirage and are thirsty, they find out that it's not really there. And, and, and it, and it kind of pains me because they did go in there and they, they purchased equipment at the, you know, you, you, you buying equipment with six, 700,000 uh -huh. miles on it for $120,000. And they made some, you know, some decisions that on a fixed expense cost is going to cost them in the long term. But what I do see is from the difference between an owner operator that has been here before and the difference between somebody that's new is their overall posture, how they handle it, how they how they look at things, how they operate their business. There's a level of calmness in this because we've seen it before. Most recently in 2019 and 2018, we've seen it, uh, you know, as far as that's concerned, but we see them operate with a different level of posture and really kind of more of a long-term strategic planning and forecasting in their mindsets and however way that they kind of portray that, but it's a level of, of, of comfort to know that, you know, Hey, it's, it's trucking the cycles, man. It's like, a, it's like a pendulum. It goes back and forth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, that's why I use some of the uh, reference points of 2019 and even 2018 in some cases, um, because the 20, you know, if you look at 2020, 2021, 22, those rates are almost outliers in statistical terms, not really reflective of a normal freight market. And what I see is, as you said, more normal market conditions that are really reflective of 2019, which for all intents and purposes, wasn't a great year for truckload carriers. We had a high number of bankruptcies occurred in that year. It was a slow, there was sort of a non-existent peak season. And we had a slow sort of, um, you know, exodus of carriers throughout the industry. This year is looking a lot like 2019 did. The, every week we go into this year, produce season wasn't that great as it ended on July 4, about half what we'd normally expect to see. We don't see any really big demand indicators happening. Uh, diesel has been flat the last couple of weeks. Um, so this is, I, I think this could be the toughest quarter for carriers so far this year. You know, we thought the first quarter was going to be tough and the second quarter, I think without any strong demand catalyst that will sort of, you know, get more freight flowing, uh, cost control is going to be absolutely critical. Uh, my gut tells me that this is going to be a pretty tough quarter for carriers. What sort of advice would you give carriers, whether they're new or old, what would you give them, what sort of advice are you giving them now as you look at the freight market? Most importantly, you got to control what you can control. You know, I, I, one of the things that we speak to carriers and, and, and as a voice is we make sure that the fleet owners and owner operators understand that they got to focus on their controllable expenses. I can't control rates, Dean. You can't control rates. Nobody can control those from a singular perspective. But however, one thing that you can control is your controllable expenses, right? Your main variable expenses like fuel. You know, you spoke about, you know, fuel being flat. My consumption and what I do with my right foot will indicate how well I'll be able to perform in a marketplace because fuel mm -hmm. consumption can swing in tens of thousands of dollars, depending on how you behave with that. So we really want to focus on that. We want, to, want our carriers to focus on fuel consumption. We want them to focus on maintenance because at the end of the day, you know, you got to be prepared for a breakdown before the breakdown. And we want to make sure that our carriers are not being stuck with being pulled off mm -hmm. because what we're seeing, Dean, is we're still seeing that time when you drop the truck off at the repair shop to the time you pick it up. Those down days could, could, you know, could could be the difference of me being able to pay my insurance one month. It could be the difference of me being able to get my IRP renewal. So it's really important that they do that. And we also uh, we also make sure that these carriers are consistently putting things and earmarking their business and their financials to put these larger expenses away. You know, just like I talked about insurance, right? You should be putting away not only the, making that insurance payment, but you got to put away a couple hundred dollars or a couple thousand, depending on. Uh, depending on your actual premium, 
Because when that renewal bounces around, you don't want to have to be stuck with having to pay that large lump sum. Right. Same right. thing as we saw some carries that struggle with IRP renewal. You'll be surprised. Uh, IRP renewal has has came and bit a lot of folks in the, in the bud as well because they're not pulling back and putting things to the side and preparing themselves for that. But mm-hmm. the most thing that we can teach them when it comes to weather in the storm like this is preparation is always going to be a leading indicator for performance. And what we always want to do is we always want to make sure that we dive down, we run lanes that we may not, and you're hearing your market update, you talk about those lanes, that may not be my favorite lane. However, in a market like this, when there's not much mm-hmm. to choose from, unfortunately, I might have to put that truck in that lane in order for me to stay profitable. Learning that break-even point and understanding where your break-even point is, and then putting 15, 20% on that break even point. So you know exactly what it's gonna take in order for you to facilitate the profitable move. So those are just some of the things that we talk about. So um, one of the things I always did with trucks that I owned or fleets that I owned, Adam, was I would always amortize some of my fixed costs over 10 months. Mm-hmm. So that I always had a couple of months buffer. Is that is that good advice or would you Absolutely. vary that? Absolutely. I mean, I, it, you know, I, I'm glad you said that because one of the things I saw and I saw a post that was posted by an owner operator a couple of days ago, we talked about it, he was getting ready to go under and he, he named like three, he named three expenses and one income. And when you say, I'm more, you know, you got to amortize, there's almost 30, 35 different things, you know, between a combination of variable and fix that you should amortize over that 10, 11, 12 mm-hmm. months. Right. Mm-hmm. And I'm talking about amortizing everything from the ELD, everything from the right. IRP taking all of that stuff out and just sitting it to the side. And just, that is when I, when I heard you say that, that tells me that that experience right there tells mm-hmm. me the difference. When you asked me the prior question, one of the things I can feel in a difference is how you do that. And what you're talking mm-hmm. about, Dean, is you're talking about preparation. You're not talking right. about, Hey, let me panic and let me do this. You're talking right. about, okay, I got to spread these things out over the long term because right. you know, whether you like it or not, you know, these, these fixed expenses, they come around. And, and, and there's no negotiation with, with, with insurance. There's no negotiation with IRP. And you got mm-hmm. 10 trucks and you need to do an IRP renewal. That's 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 almost 20 grand when you got to, you know, that right. you got to have to be sitting right. on. And for, for an owner operator, um, you know, I've sort of been worried for a little while now that a lot of owner operators are, are a breakdown away from going out of business because notwithstanding the time off the road and the opportunity cost of not generating revenue, the businesses today where where rates are right now they're really not generating enough profit to cover some major expenses and i think there's there's an inevitability around major breakdowns whether it be a drivetrain or transmission or your rears there's always something that goes wrong with trucks like it's just you can never sit there and think yeah. nothing's going to go wrong because the minute you do that um you know you've got lights flashing and beepers going off on your dash so yeah, I think that's uh, that's interesting advice. You know, we're sort of coming up on time here. Uh, one question I did want to ask you: um, Now that you know what you know, what would you tell a young Adam Wingfield today as he plans to get into the trucking business? You know, I think the, the very first thing is is depending on what level that you're getting into. Um, you know, you've got a plan to to live on the road and visit home. You know, I see right. a lot of folks when they become owner operators from a company driver perspective you know they're wanting to be home you know every two days of the week or be home weekly and and sometimes that doesn't bode well with your business model you got to look at the business model first if that's your intent to be an owner operator and and make money um you know unfortunately you've got to do them you know you got to do the math and sometimes that means you got to stay out a little bit longer and sometimes that means that you got to run the lanes that you have to run I think the second biggest advice that I would give myself is, is is business first. You know, if I look back at it, I made some critical mistakes in the very, very beginning that were very, very costly. And part of those mistakes was that learning that learning curve that I didn't necessarily work, was prepared for. But being a business person first, understanding the importance of being able to, as simple as it may be, and, and we're not talking about anything complex here, but uh, being able to read a P&L, you know, being able to break down a load and being able to break down your break-even costs to ensure that, you know, for the majority of the time when you're operating, you're operating profitably. Yeah. Adam, a couple of questions have come in. One here is a really good question, and it's not the first time we get this question, but uh, Willie Reed asks, I'm looking to lease my truck to a company. What are some things to look for when choosing a, a lease on company? Man, the first thing you really want to look at is do you do you do your due diligence on the company? And and I'm glad he mentioned that because we've seen some folks that are using that lease model to scale their companies, but they really don't have a good business model in place. They have you know unsatisfactory safety ratings. They've got freight guards all over the place. 
Uh, so you got to be careful when you choose that. Make sure you go to their safer and make sure you take a look at the safer and see what the safer says. You know, also, you got to look at uh, all of the expenses that they're going to cover and what they're not going to cover. I've seen folks paying as high as 20, 25 percent on a lease on model and still having to pay insurance, still having to pay all of the costs that they would associate themselves with if they were just going to stick on the owner operator platform. Find out if they're running. Number one, uh, another important part is find out if they run a spot freight. You know, if you weren't leasing on a company and, you know, their primary business model is all spot freight, then, then you probably want to go in a different direction. You want to see where those contract, make sure you get to a lease going company that has a, a good balance of majority of, mm -hmm. of contracted freight. Uh, and, and I think that's really important. Um, okay. One of the other questions we got, um, and this was last week, a sort of an anticipation I carried this over, but what are some of the, the most common, if you have to list the most common mistakes that carriers make when they're working with brokers, what would they be? You know, I think the communication piece is number one. I think, you know, not building relationships, you know, a lot of times they get on the brokers and I'll be honest with you, even as carriers these days, you know, they always think the brokers is the bad guys. And unfortunately being a 3PL um, sometimes is your, your gateway to success. Number one is really not focusing on building a relationship. You know, number two is not communicating. And when I mean communicating, you're providing a service to a customer. And when you're operating and you're working with a broker, you know, you might not want to hear this and this might not be agreeable, but the broker is your customer. You know, you've got to provide service to that customer. And one of the things that they fail to do is they fail to provide great customer service to that right. broker who can mm -hmm. potentially open them up to not only just better plan freight, but just open them up to better lanes, being that carrier of choice. And I think mm -hmm. that when they don't do that, I think it's detrimental to the company as well. But those two things and building mm -hmm. that relationship and being great on those communication points, ensuring that through the entire transit that they're providing updates, that they're staying on top of paperwork, submitting the BOLs when, you know, prior to request. And at the end of the delivery, man, shoot an email to those brokers and, and ask for feedback on what you could do better. Right. right. You know, that's great advice. I don't know that a lot of uh, owner operators in particular would consider their broker a customer. I think that's fantastic advice. Um, that brings us sort of to the end of the show. I'd love to keep talking, Adam, uh, but we do sort of have some commitments here. You've got to travel and get going. Um, in terms of uh, some shout outs this week, uh, what to look for, where DAT will be. Um, I'm going to be on sales chatter tomorrow with Dan Deegan, 11 a.m. Eastern. Uh, Robert Rouse is on landline now tomorrow night at 7 p.m. Uh, Sirius XM channel 146 Road Dog Radio. Uh, on Freightvine, our podcast this week is Professor Yossi Sheffi. Um, he's a director at MIT. He's discussing the evolution of data science. Our shipper team is going to be at CSCMP EDGE conference coming up shortly in Kissimmee, Florida. Um, this uh, October 10 to 12, uh, DATCON, that's our shipper and broker summit. That October 10 to 12, make sure you put that in your calendar at the Houston Western Galleria. Um, on our show next week, we have Professor Jason Miller from Michigan State University. Uh, don't forget that our market update will be published this evening. Uh, we've got some interesting charts and reports in there. Um, and that's it's uh, sort of time to wrap up our show. But before we do that, Adam, how can people get in contact with you? They can just visit our website, www.innovativelogisticsgroup.io, and just chat with the bot there on the website and reach out to us directly that way. Okay. All right, we might be able to put that in the comment section for you so you've got that address there at Innovative Logistics. All right, Adam, thank you so much uh, for being on the show. This has been fantastic. We have to get you back on more often. Um, and with that, we'll bring our show to an end. Be safe, everybody. Uh, it's very hot out there in some parts of the country. It's wet in others. Uh, keep an eye on the weather reports. Um, and we'll see you back here again next week. Thank you.